transfers from World Pop, Data for Good at Meta, IPC, and others. Today, we are pleased to have with us experts from the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, HOT in short, to share on their work in humanitarian action and community development through open mapping. When a major disaster strikes anywhere in the world, HOT is able to mobilize thousands of volunteers who come together online and on the ground to create open map data that enables disaster responders to reach those in need. My name is Meta Sabia Salu. I'm an HDX data manager with Ocho Center for Humanitarian Data, and I'll be your host for today. I'm pleased to introduce our presenters, uh, Rebecca Firth, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Interim Executive Director, Paul Uiloy, uh, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Director of Data, Hani Fombena, Geographic Information Systems Associate, Open Mapping Hub, Asia Pacific, based in the Philippines, Jan Unen, OpenStreetMap Trainer, Open Mapping Hub, Asia Pacific, based in Turkey. A very warm welcome to all of you. We are thrilled to have you with us today. During this webinar, uh, we'll cover the following uh, topics. To kick us off, I will invite Rebecca to share her opening remarks. I'll come back to give an overview on HDX and HOT datasets on the platform. Then Paul will give us an overview on HOT's work. Hani and Jan will then follow with a case study on Turkey's Syria earthquake. Finally, we'll have time for questions and answers. As we progress with the different agenda items, please be sure to use the chat feature to send your questions or comments. We'll try our best to compile and bring them uh, for discussion in the Q&A part. With that, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Rebecca for her opening remarks. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone um, who's dialed in from around the world today. Really appreciate you taking um, some time to learn about HOT and HDX and um, how HDX has managed to scale our work um, globally. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the organization um, to give you a little more context. Um, so HOT is a, an international team um, which is dedicated to humanitarian action and community development, um, all of that with open mapping, so open map data. Um, so we work to provide uh, map data which supports um, disaster management, risk reduction um, and contributes to all of the SDGs. Uh, when you see the word community and you kind of hear us talking about ourselves as a team, I think that can be confusing what that means. Um, so HOT's quite a small staff team, around 100 per people, um, but is really powered by this huge community of volunteers um, who come together to um, update the map. Um, and that community has sort of nearly half a million people in it, um, and our goal is to grow to um, one million community mappers. Um, in terms of where this came from, where this all began, um, HOT started um, in around 2010 in the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake. Um, and uh, obviously the earthquake struck, it was very devata devastating in scale and had struck a location where there was much informal housing and a mu much housing that was very vulnerable to an earthquake um, and caused um, very widespread devastation. Obviously, this is one of the most famous um, uh, disasters of our, our time. Um, and an international response grew and many kind of groups um, from outside Haiti landed to um, to work on the response effort um, and found the challenge of being unable to effectively coordinate their efforts due to a lack of maps, a lack of basic information about um, the place that they were trying to trying to work. Um, so HOT was kind of founded by a group of volunteers who came together to create that map. They used satellite imagery to draw buildings and roads um, and produce a map which was actually um, used by responders to the earthquake. Um, and, you know, that was 2010 and now sort of more than a decade later, there's um, so many different ways in which mapping is being executed, mapping is being applied, which goes far beyond kind of drawing buildings and roads and into um, some very kind of complicated things, um, but is... Um, you know, I think this kind of Haiti inception story is a really uh, nice example of kind of the power and the simplicity of maps to help in um, in up in disasters. Um, so HOT joined the HDX platform in 2014, um, 
kind of providing OpenStreetMap exports to HDX, um, but a kind of automatic, um, automated link between OpenStreetMap and HDX was built in 2016. Um, and that was really game changing for us. It really helped to link the data that we were producing to real time humanitarian operations. It helped us to bring our community members who are giving up their free time to create a map of the world around them to um, be able to have more confidence that they were directly influencing and directly part of humanitarian response and humanitarian work on the ground. And um, so it's been an absolutely fundamental and, and very prized and precious um, partnership for us. Um, we're, we're very grateful to be in the top three downloads of HDX. So uh, we've seen huge year on year growth in terms of usage of the data from HDX. And yeah, it really helps us to make sure that the work we're doing is in the hands of people who need it. Um, in the last couple of years, we have really been working on our strategy to localize and ensure that we can um, support mapping growth um, at a really global scale. Um, so we're trying to work in about 94 countries. Um, and uh, we wanted to do that through uh, kind of decentralizing and working through this network of open mapping hubs, which would really enable HOT to kind of have fingerprints all over the world and to be able to catalyze the work of local actors, local communities, local partners um, in very many countries without requiring, you know, a heavy global presence. Um, so we have these four regional hubs, which you can see on the slide here, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, Western Northern Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa and Asia Pacific. Um, those hubs are all um, supporting um, efforts in 94 countries and they can support you and your work and we would love to talk to you about ways, um, ways in which we could do that. Um, so I'm going to pause there because I know we have a lot more exciting things to go over in this webinar, but thank you so much for giving some time to, to learn about our work. Um, and I think I'm handing um, back, back to you. Yes, thank you so much, Rebecca, for your remarks and very interesting to see the journey that um, HOT has uh, um, taken uh, since 2010. Um, so I will now move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, just to give you an overview on the center, the HDX platform and the HOT data sets uh, hosted uh, there. So UN OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data was established uh, with a goal to increase the use and impact of data and humanitarian response. And to do that, um, the center structured its work into these uh, four focus areas. Data services, um, increasing the interoperability of data through shared standards and integrated systems. Data science, increase, uh, increasing OCHA's ability to anticipate crisis before they happen. Data responsibility, increasing trust and cooperation across organizations sharing data and humanitarian response learning and practice, increasing the capability of people to access and use data in support of humanitarian efforts. The Humanitarian Data Exchange Platform, or HDX in short, um, was established in 2014. And since then, we have seen growth in many dimensions. In 2022 only, um, HDX was used by 1.5 million people in 233 countries and territories. It's an increase of 8% compared with 2021. And around 1.8 million uh, data sets were downloaded throughout the year. Organizations have also added uh, 3,700 new and updated data sets in 2022 only bringing the total to more than uh, 20,400 data sets. Currently, um, we, are, uh, close to, we have close to 300 active organizations sharing data on the platform. Given um, their commitment to open source data and tools, um, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, became one of the first organizations, as Rebecca mentioned, to join HDX when it uh, launched in 2014. And since then, the, they have been adding uh, data sets now uh, totaling to 4,400 data sets covering 249 countries and territories. In 2022, the data exported by HOT to HDX um, was downloaded almost 67,000 times by users in 194 countries and territories. Um, road network data for Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Pakistan were among the most popular 
and data sets shared by HOT continue to be um, in high demand, especially at the onset of a new crisis, providing first responders with the geographical awareness that is essential for humanitarian action. So with that, um, I will now pass it on to Paul for the deep dive into the HOT uh, uh, work. So of Paul, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, of course, we're telling you uh, a bit more of the, the background of HOT's work um, uh, for about five minutes, and then we'll dive into a case study specifically on the, the humanitarian and disaster response for Turkey and Syria, which will be led by Jan and, and Honey. So, um, overall, HOT's mission has, has grown dramatically over the past decade and a bit from being focused on disaster response first and foremost and trying to find ways which we could effectively support that in the, the, the international humanitarian system to being an organization which is really focused on uh, getting um, data into the hands of communities and really putting them as kind of first class citizens, making them be the ones that not only benefit from data availability, but are the ones that are key to uh, data contributions and actually uh, the ones providing a lot of the data and uh, making sure the perspective of local communities is uh, key and fundamental in uh, the maps and the data we create and provide. So the vision of HOT uh, consists of, of three parts uh, in order to enable that. Uh, one, to make sure that community needs are addressed through mapping, and that also means that their needs are like at the forefront of, of our work and what we think about. Uh, it's not about what we feel, just about what we feel are the gaps and what's needed, but it is about what local communities flag to us are the local issues they struggle with and what they want to address and don't have issue insufficient tools or data to, to highlight. Uh, two, that uh, we ensure that there's as little barriers to access as you know we we can achieve. So, ensuring that everyone is able to access uh, access the data, uh, but also contribute to the data. And I think especially the second part is key. That uh, it's not just about looking at the data; it's about being able to also um, make sure your experiences um, uh, being made part of that that data and uh, is included. Um, and thirdly, that um, um, that data is actually used for impactful use cases and scenarios, both in um, um, international development and in humanitarian work and disaster response. So, um, especially the third part is where a lot of the data access via HGX um, has a key part and a key role to play. Um, HOTS work has um, um, indeed grown from uh, disaster and humanitarian response. Um, and as we all know, this is like um, yeah, this is a major issue, and um, it's the amount of people being affected by disaster is only increasing um, at the moment. Uh, there's more drivers also with climate um, uh, climate change and effects that are playing a part in um, the increase in devastation by by disaster. So it's still a key part of our work. Um, however, we've grown beyond that to um, our next slide. Um, if you look at the overall work, it's grown from just being focused on and starting out from disaster to um, five impact areas, as we call them, which are basically general buckets of work that we want to focus ourselves on um, and address key use cases in with disaster and climate, sustainable cities and communities. So we also have a lot of work in urban settings looking at um, uh, the effects of urbanization, access to education, health, um, uh, public transport, etc. Uh, public health in and of itself. Um, a lot of our work is done via also the Map Missing Maps Consortium, which is a collaboration with the American British Red Cross, um, MSF, Native Sons of Frontier, and other partners in that space. Displacement and safe migration um, and gender equality. And all of the work is done on the, the principles of open data and open street map. Um, on my next slide. I think a lot of you will be familiar with the, the general concept, but uh, this is an open map of the world. Um, what data you can just look at and inspect, uh, but can actually access, utilize in your own applications and data, etc. And this is an open contribution model akin to, to Wikipedia. Uh, so everyone is able to contribute um, data, and you, as you'll see, and probably also experienced, uh, uh, a major benefit of this is that data is available anywhere there is um, a data need, people willing to contribute, etc. So 
high quality data isn't limited to the Western world, but is also available in Africa, Asia Pacific, South and Central America, Oceania, etc. Um, how does this work? Um, there's a number of ways to contribute to OpenStreetMap. Um, on the one hand, there's a lot of use of remote sensing, uh, working on satellite imagery to uh, procure the latest in, in terms of like um, uh, satellite imagery. Um, there's an increasing use of UAV and drone imagery um, and tracing that using various tools. There's also an increasing um, angle of automation there and pulling in AI um, and ML derived data sources. So uh, feature detection via AI machine learning. Um, if you click through on the slide once more, some more things are going to pop up. Yeah, uh, another part of this, of course, is that um, you're only able to learn so much via remote sensing. You can see where there's the buildings and the roads, but you, that does not tell you what is the name of the road or that health facility or um, how many staff are, and beds are actually available at that health facility, etc. So. The really powerful thing here um, starts to appear when you combine remote sensing with local knowledge and uh, mobile mapping and are really able to leverage uh, the types of data that you can only know when you're actually present and living in um, certain locations. And all in all this combines to um, uh, create um, an incredibly powerful source of, of ground truth community contributed data in OpenStreetMap. Um, as Rebecca also just mentioned, uh, an increasing amount of work is done via the open mapping hubs on the next slide. Um, uh, and they're really at the forefront of us work nowadays. So a lot of the work that we used to do from global teams or people like moving in and out of countries is now being done via regional hubs, um, which are much more embedded into local ecosystems and much better able to connect local NGOs, local government officials and decision makers. Um, and um, uh, get them to um, start leveraging more of the open data, the possibilities of open data. Um, and yeah, the overall goal is to ensure we get viable community organizations across the globe and um, really be a, a catalyst and an inspiration for the whole, the whole open data and open mapping movement. So with that, handing it over to Chan to talk more specifically about how we um, operated and worked in the, the Turkey and Syria response. John. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And like, I'm also going to just hand it over to Hani quickly. Sorry about that. <laughs> to, 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 to start talking about the um, data activities um, and then I will take over. Sorry. Okay, so uh, I'll can you move to the next slide? So February 6, 2023, a powerful magnitude 7.8 earthquake rocked central Turkey and northern Syria. In terms of data, our initial response is to open hot tasking manager projects to activate volunteer activities and map, map the impact zones. But this activation is very unique. This is the first time HOT was tapped by multiple partners to support two bordering countries in one activation. It was challenging, especially since there were political conflicts happening on both countries, especially for Syria, where we have no existing open street map communities that could help us make sense of what uh, is happening on ground and what data sets are needed for rescue and evacuation. But with the support of our partners, we collaborated and opened a total of 16 tasking manager projects covering the hard hit areas, both in Turkey and Syria. As of today, 9 out of 16 are 100% mapped and 6 from them are fully validated. Next slide, please. Even though I personally check uh, the mapping progress in OSM every day, I'm still amazed by the power of volunteerism that the mappers have shown. The sense of urgency was felt across the globe, with several OSM communities and individual volunteers mapping in solidarity with Turkey and Syria. As of April 17, more than 2 million buildings were mapped and almost 84,000 kilometers of roads were traced by over 9,000 OSM contributors all over the world. Next slide, please. So 23 unique data sets uh, from OSM in support of Turkey and Syria are exported and housed in HDX. 
which the hot tech team updates daily. From February to March, where the peak of the response and evacuation activities took place, a total of 1,910 downloads for these data sets were counted in HTX. Even looking at the downloads and total page views for the last 24 weeks, we can see that the highest values were observed on February 13, which is just a week after the disaster event. Next slide, please. And looking at the download behavior of our OSM users, we can see that during the first week of the activation, building footprints, road networks, and populated places in Turkey are the top three downloaded data sets from HDX, all of which are baseline data. But when the data for the destroyed buildings in Turkey became available, it continuously appeared as the data set with the most downloads, having more than 700 downloads by the end of March. Next slide, please. So these maps from several organizations prove that during the initial weeks of the activation, OSM was indeed used as baseline or exposure data with the building footprints and roads utilized in each of their own analysis. And when the data of the destroyed buildings became available in HDX, we saw multiple uses of the data in static and interactive maps. Later on, uh, we will be able to give a closer look of how these products were used on ground. So for a detailed discussion of the Turkey response, uh, let me call on Dr. John Unen from the Open Mapping Hub Asia Pacific. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hani, and welcome uh, all of the attendees. So, like I see 114 people listening to us. Uh, so, um, I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit about how that um, stories have evolved in Turkey on the ground, how that data uh, was used, how that data was used, that like how the data helped um, people on the ground, and also a couple of feedback from couple of feedback and words from the, 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 the Turkish community. So my name is John. I'm based in Izmir, Turkey. Uh, I'm living in a uh, unharmed and unaffected region of within Turkey, but um, I have um, been since uh, more than 10 years past has been a part of the Turkish open street map community. So because of that, I was also heavily involved within the um, open street map uh, mapping activation and mapping coordination within Turkey. So. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so well, there were a couple of users. So the the, the um, government organizations, the Search and Rescue Association, the Ministry of Inter Disaster and Emergency Management Agency, etc. So lots of the organizations in Turkey have their own data sets or have their own internal data structures, etc. But um, in the field at the time of that urgency, it was not very easy for the field personnel, field staff to tap onto these kinds of resources. So the next thing was um, they were looking at is what, what, what other available open sources of data are there. So uh, we have seen lots of access and lots of use of OpenStreetMap data. We have seen that in the OpenStreetMap Turkish community channels, lots of um, requests on like how they can access that data, how those actors will be able to use that data, and the map that you see in, is 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 one of those examples. So uh, with the disaster and emergency management uh, presidency and association uh, also collaborating with the search and rescue association of Turkey, they they they, they needed situation maps because like. Um, there were reports of collapsed buildings, there were reports of um, help requests, but they needed the base data. So how they can reach that places, how, I mean, where, where, are, where are the building footprints, etc. And also on top of that, they were able to put these reported collapsed buildings, reported helps, and also the collapsed building data that was generated in OpenStreetMap. So um, in the situation maps, we were, they were able to use these kinds of um, information. We can go to the next slide if you want. Um, again, ACUT is the Disaster uh, Search and Rescue Association. Uh, again, you are seeing, again, use of um, OpenStreetMap data, base data, and also the destroyed building data sets in their situation maps. Um, similarly, when the Ministry of Health doctors uh, were deployed in the area, um, there were instances that they were not able to find where, they, where, where to go to, to access um, because they were not natives of those cities, they were they were they don't they don't know where is where, and 
um, they, they, they just wanted to just uh, use the mobile navigation apps that conveniently we are using every day, but because of coverage issues, because of other issues, they were not able to have uh, signal and service. And um, we have seen that um, mobile apps, uh, which are having offline data um, and working with OpenStreetMap data, were able to help um, the, the, the first responders also navigate within the cities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is again a video that's available on the YouTube channel and after uh, Honey takes over again, I'm going to share the links of those videos for you to also able to access through Mental Open Street Map Team's YouTube channel. Um, this is also an example of the post disaster mapping uh, activities. So there were lots of uh, tent campsites, uh, temporary resettlements that were set up and again another um, medical staff uh Mehmet Faruk Uchum was able to map the tents and the in, in the in the in the settlements and was able to give numbers to the tents etc so there was micro mapping going on in the uh, settlements uh and um when you watch that video you will see that um that data and that detailed map of the settlement of the of the, of the campsite was used extensively in um infrastructure planning, infrastructure access, like, like electricity, water, et cetera, and also lots of health services. And at one point, he's also describing that uh, in, a, in a very Jon Snow-like manner. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you are familiar with the uh, legendary Dr. Jon Snow, that was like, um, who was able to uh, map the cholera outbreak in London, they were able to pinpoint and locate the outbreaks within the campsite as well by using that map. So I think that's a very also um, exciting and inspiring story going on there. So ne next slide, please. So we have also asked uh, the, the, the Turkish Open Street Map community and lots of the um, volunteer mappers within the Turkish Open Street Map community and say, how did you verify the accuracy and usability of the Open Street Map data you were using? Uh, so the pre-event imagery provided means to verify the geometries of roads and building data. So it goes for the remote mappers as well. So uh, there was the available satellite imagery before the event so that the volunteer mappers were able to trace out the roads and buildings that were already there before the event. And um, after some time, because of the cloud coverage, because of the, 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 the timelines of the satellite orbits, etc., um, post-event imagery have started to come. So those imagery were used to verify the, the, the destroyed and collapsed buildings um, within the area. And where available, openly accessible street level imagery, uh, it might be Carta view, it might be mapillary, et cetera. So there were some volunteers from uh, sometimes were able to capture the street level imagery to get a picture of what's happening on the ground. And also like post event imagery is also uh, including some of the drone operators volunteering and, and, and submitting drone imagery uh, for, for certain regions as well. Next slide, please. Um, the other question, one of the main, like, what are the data quality issues that you encountered in using OpenStreetMap data? Um, so, uh, because of the vast area, uh, the first the initial mapping was started using the AI-assisted mapping, especially on dense urban settings. The AI-assisted mapping like led to some inaccuracies because if the buildings were side to side, um, it was having a um, hard time and inaccuracies in identifying the individual buildings. So there were a little bit, um, some inaccuracies in the urban, dense urban settings. And sometimes the AI assisted mapping was also um, suggesting the road classifications, et cetera, uh, and wrong. And um, although the OpenStreetMap editors were just warning the users about these the potential issues, um, there were lots of um, volunteers that are newly just meeting OpenStreetMap, so they were not very experienced. So uh, there were lots of misinterpretation of OpenStreetMap editor warnings in there. So it also affected the data quality. And then um, there were a couple of passes of validation uh, efforts with the validation team and validated, validation trainees of Fremantle and OpenStreetMap team in order to just correct these issues and also improve the data. And also the incomplete damage data, uh, I will also talk about a little bit about that um, because of the limited coverage of the post-disaster imagery. I mean, the, the, the 
destroyed building data sets might not be reflecting potentially it's not reflecting the entire region because it is just generated with the imagery that's only available uh, and mainly in the uh, main uh, larger major settlements next please um, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in using OpenStreetMap for emergency response efforts? Is like complete the map data before even any emergency strikes. So, like I just want to emphasize the um, like 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 um, <clears throat> anticipatory action there. So um, there there was a huge surge of like data requests, lots of questions, lots of needs, lots of uh, requests for mapping, etc. But if it was just if it was before something like that happened, and if the if the if the map data if the if the base was um, more or less complete before that event happened, just after the event, like it would have been possible to have the up to date and complete building and road footprints for that region. But uh, because the data was still incomplete, like there were there was some time that was required to also to generate the base data and the buildings and roads. So the best uh, advice would be that like within the anticipatory action, just complete the map if you can before any emergency strikes. Next, please. Um, what were the other sources of data collaboration during the activation? So Yax is an, uh, an NGO in Turkey and part of the Turkish OpenStreetMap community has just set up um, uh, the communication channels immediately, both internally and also internationally. And there was an international coordination group that was going on there. Lots of uh, actors within the humanitarian um, uh, within the humanitarian sector were there and collaborating, and even like other sources of data sets, even other other data that's in between, like 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 the organizations um, were shared, and 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 the organizations were able to coordinate through those communication channels and. Um, there were also other sources of data because of licensing issues. It was not uh, it was not possible to import that data or reflect that data in OpenStreetMap uh, because the licenses were incompatible. So, but, but the data is open. The data is like we can share the data, but like the data cannot be represented in OpenStreetMap. So that coordination group and that coordination activities were also like covering that part of. Um, the, that data data sets as well. So uh, we can go to the next slide. And before passing again to the, the what was what was the what was happening in Syria? Like uh, the last question was, how do you think OpenStreetMap data could be used in future emergency response efforts? And how can OpenStreetMap data be improved to be used during the recovery efforts? Like if the base map is kept accurate and up to date by the community and other local and regional actors. Volunteer mapping efforts can be more focused on the physical situation on the ground instead of just playing catch up with uh, constantly changing environment and constantly changing situation. Because by the time that you are completing some sort of base data, um, lots of things have changed are changing on the ground, and uh, because of this latencies, like the, the, the having complete and up to date data sets, uh, were not always might not always be possible to be available just on time in a timely manner. And lots of things is happening in an emergency situation like that. So um, these are the remarks and stories that we got from um, the Turkish community, Turkish Open Street Up community. And I think I'll right now just pass to Paul to talk about a little bit about Syria as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, just a, a brief word on Syria. Um, obviously, this, this was a Quite a complicated disaster overall, with um, the impacts being split between Turkey, which is a, a relatively stable environment, uh, and Syria, which is um, and has for some time been essentially a conflict and war zone. Um, so, one aspect I want to highlight in Syria is also how we um, are looking at and working on on data protection and responsibility issues. So, um, we have developed um, a framework on and a data quality, data responsibility assessment internally that we are applying to um, all these um, disaster response efforts alongside with all our other projects. Uh, which means that we are looking at a time on the also the potential um, uh, side effects and um, negative impacts of generating and collecting additional data on on populations and people affected. Um, 
So uh, that does mean that we will be um, doing context categorization looking at what type of context are we in and depending on the, the stability and the contextual factors, uh, be doing additional uh, due diligence and assessments on what type of data is uh, safe to collect, uh, um, what can, could have potentially negative consequences, etc. And especially as we are working um, uh, primarily in an open data setting, we also need to be considering that data we collect is going to be available on OpenStreetMap um, and other open data sources um, more or less indefinitely. Um, you can't uh, necessarily take data back once it's been contributed and created. So um, you need to think about what is the other potential implications of collecting data on health facilities. I mean, there's been a history in conflict zones, especially recently, of attacks on, on health facilities. Um, um, and those types of, of issues. So that's one thing I want to highlight for Syria. Uh, one thing that uh, we um, uh, have been grappling with in Syria on the, on the next slide is also how to balance um, uh, tasking uh, the data we create between opposition and government's health areas of Syria. Um, given that this is more of a humanitarian setting, we also need to consider more of the how do we stay in line with humanitarian principles and ensure that also to uh, organizations working their populations, we uh, do appear as a neutral entity and not one that's um, uh, having a preference for one side of the conflict over another. So that's been a factor in how we um, also set up uh, tasking and addressing of data gaps in Syria, uh, trying to balance needs on the ground in terms of what are data gaps, uh, what are the most severe impacts with um, uh, the areas of control and making sure we strike a good a good balance there uh, with the parties that we have on the grounds that are actually requesting this data. Um, on the next one, um, uh, we did start out with an initial assessment of what data is available, uh, what do we have in terms of health facilities, um, order coping capacity, etc. And using that as the basis for assessing um, uh, data gaps in combination with partner needs, etc. So yeah, then handing over to Honey for um, a specific highlight on uh, damage assessments and using OSM data for those purposes. Yes, um, next slide, please. So before the actual use of OSM data for building damage assessments, we would like to showcase that this new tool that we have developed in the Open Mapping Hub Asia Pacific, the Map is a QGIS plugin that could help us determine areas with high disaster risk level with little to no OSM data available. This way we can ensure that OSM data is available in disaster hotspots even before a disaster strikes. So other than this, another tool that we use in identifying um, areas that are needed to be mapped is Disaster Ninja. So next slide, please. After ensuring that uh, OSM data, specifically building footprints are completely mapped in OSM, we can now use them as baseline or exposure data for post earthquake damage assessments. So when you overlay the intensity data set onto the OSM building footprints, it is possible to identify which buildings are likely to have been damaged and make use of additional information from OSM tags like building types, building levels, and building material. Also, OSM data can be linked with existing damage analysis such as UNOSAT and Copernicus for the uh, latest activation in Turkey and Syria allowing the building footprints to assist in identifying and validating different damage grades within an area. So this means that OSM data can be used to complement other types of data and provide a more comprehensive understanding of the extent of damage caused by the earthquake. So we have provided a step-by-step -step guide on this OSM data use case. Uh, it's available in the hot, uh, hot toolbox. So next slide, please. For Turkey, more than 1.7 million buildings affected by the earthquake are mapped in OSM, and 3,259 out of them are tagged as destroyed. A quick analysis and visualization of these OSM data can help us to better understand what happened on ground. This heat map shows that the destroyed buildings are con concentrated in the areas of Hatay, Osmaniyek, Kasiantep, Karaman Maras, and Atiyaman. 
This is just one example of the various damage assessments performed by our partners and other organizations using OSM data. Uh, now, uh, John will show us how these damage data were validated through satellite imageries and the challenges we encountered while validating. So, John, take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honey. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, um, so this is also one of the uh, maps that were like um, within the first week of the event. Um, this is um, more of a like how the data was used, in fact. So um, the, the IFRC uh, working with the Turkish Red Cross and um, the, the OpenStreetMap based data and also the, the, the damage data that were um, available were used to identify um, the, the, the damaged health facilities and also by the, looking at the distribution of, that, of the collapse, uh, also the sense of urgency, sense of regional urgency as well. Uh, there were also other um, analysis and works done, like like overlaying the pharmacies with the collapse building information, so that in order to get a sense of um, where the pharmacies are operational, where the pharmacies are not, etc. So there were lots of um, use cases like that on the ground that would help uh, the decision makers. But um, again, I just wanted to emphasize the collapse building data, which was the most downloaded, but Again, I also want to emphasize there were some limitations and there were some hardships when uh, that data uh, was generated. So within the next slide, I can um, touch uh, on a couple of things. So, so I already mentioned a bit like the, the, the post image, post, post disaster imagery and the post disaster imagery was not immediately available because at the time of the earthquake, it was heavy cloud coverage. There was snowing in the region, uh, in most of the region. So for two or three days, the cloud coverage didn't go. So we were not able to, or nobody was able to get um, a, 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 a post disaster imagery regarding the region. So again, that was also one of the blockers. That was also one of the issues that were faced globally. So like, we are not able to get a picture. We are not able to see the, 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 see the general picture of what's happening on the ground. And, but after a couple of days, once the weather has been uh, cleared out, once the clouds have been cleared out, uh, like imagery providers like Planet, like Maxar, um, through the Open Data Program, um, they have started sharing um, up-to-date post-disaster imagery sets. And um, with the imagery coordination group and also with the help of the Turkish uh, community as well, we were able to share all of those imagery and all of those images were documented and shared through Open Aerial Map. And it is still uh, available there, all of the open data, open image resources are available for access there, but you are roughly seeing the grids that have imagery coverage and you can see that like it is not uh, covering the entire earthquake region uh, completely. So because of that, um, you might have like when, when, when we are looking at the collapsed buildings, when we are mapping out the collapsed buildings, um, because of that coverage, um, all of the collapsed buildings within the area might not be able to get reflected and, and digitize an open street map. And next, please. Thank you. Um, you are seeing one of the examples within the city of Kahraman Marash, and like uh, this, uh, this is a drone imagery uh, again uploaded and shared by one of the volunteers. Uh, thanks, help that NGO for providing those uh, flights and imageries as well. And you can see that we, uh, the identification of collapse and destroyed building were possible, but what about other levels of damage? So we were limited uh, in that sense in order to identify the damaged buildings that are still standing, but um, experiencing some level of damage. And this was a very uh, big limitation uh, in terms of the, the setting the whole picture, general picture of what's been on the ground. And next slide, please. Um, as I said, there were other data sources also available. So this is the, 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 the data that was shared by the uh, Ministry of Urbanization in tabular format, but that data was uh, geocoded by looking at the address information, but still um, because of some licensing compatibilities, et cetera, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't possible for the OpenStreetMap community to reflect that information. So again, this data, there were also other accessible data sets that are giving a larger picture and also showing the damage states of the buildings, et cetera. Um, but 
um, because of that, like again, the, 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 the destroyed buildings and damaged buildings data set um, was limited sort of an open street map. So we were able to only share the destroyed buildings where we are not able to share because of that, um, the, the full extent of the damaged buildings through HDX. So I, yeah, I just wanted to also like address these issues when we were talking about the uh, most downloaded data sets of the HDX. And um, this is the end of my update and, and, and address as well. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, and very impressive work um, that HOT is doing along with open mapping hubs on uh, disaster mapping to help response ac activities. And also very interesting to hear about the different engagements and collaborations with local actors to validate and make the products more and more useful for uh, use by humanitarian and other actors. So thank you for uh, sharing uh, those details with us, Hani, Paul, and uh, Jan. I will now open the floor for questions and answers. Um, once again, to our audience, if you have a, any questions, uh, please use the chat feature to send it in. Um, to get us started, um, I have a question. Um, so in the past, um, as you mentioned er early on, uh, Rebecca, in your remarks, uh, with the earthquake in Haiti, um, and now all the way to today with uh, Turkey and Syria earthquake, um, I want to ask how has the role um, of uh, open mapping and community engagement evolved in the humanitarian response uh, space? Um, maybe over to you, Rebecca, on, on that. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that question. Um, so I think kind of, I guess, as the examples um, that we shared in the webinar um, showed over different, um, you know, from 2010 Haiti through to um, the, the, the Turkey Syria earthquake just now, kind of the art of the possible with data had changed quite a lot. And that was due to the volume of data and the under, like the kind of capacity of humanitarian organizations to use that. Um, so I think kind of the biggest change is, you know, OSM is now, you know, considered best practice and widely used in um, humanitarian response by all major players. Um, and that kind of mindset shift and awareness that OSM is actually a really quality data source, it has the right kind of, um, you know, that it it's the, the best um, data source to use has, has been a massive shift that's happened over that time. Um, from Haiti when it was completely unheard of, had never been used in this kind of context before. Um, I think the second piece there, and like this is something that we take really seriously in our role at HOT, is, you know, if the expectation is that it is there and it is used, that we're there, then we also need to be able to reliably mobilize the community to produce the data that's needed. And obviously, you know, contributing to major disasters is something that's really motivating for people. There's a, a lot of coverage in the media of major disasters, and um, this is something that people really want to kind of contribute to. Um, but, you know, it's important that we make sure that we're channeling that effort, making sure that we're ensuring that the data quality is high, that the validation of the data is matching um, the kind of production of the data and things like that, which is really tough. Um, and then I think the final thing and like what we're looking to moving forward is encouraging increasing local ownership of the disaster response itself. Um, this is a tough thing to do often, you know, the definition of a disaster is that it's something that overwhelms local capacity. And so um, that is something that's really complicated. But I think Chan and Har Hani's um, example that they shared of the difference between Turkey and Syria and the response that was possible there is a really good example of kind of Turkey where there was a local community that was really strong, that was ready, that was able to um, kind of help translate the response locally, help to run and maintain local partnerships. Um, that was that's kind of a really good example of the direction we want to be moving in countries like Syria um, and our kind of priority countries where the existing mapping community might be small or growing. Um, there are places where we would would love to be able to build the capacity to have um, that local um, coordination of um, disaster response when um, when appropriate. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a lot of different ways in which this has evolved um, over time, but I think that the two kind of key points would be um, it's, you know, 
best practice widely expected and increasing local ownership over disaster response. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for that. Um, so I have a question coming from the audience. Uh, Martin asks, if a hot mapping takes longer than expected, will data be uploaded to HDX before mapping or validation is complete? Um, and is this indicated on HDX in the metadata? Uh, maybe this one I will pass it to Honey, if that's okay. Yeah, I think uh, John already answered that, um, yeah, the validation efforts were focused on regions where there was higher urgency. So, um, although sometimes um, the mapping in the hot tasking manager and the validation activities uh, is not yet completed, um, we there is urgency to use the data set. So, we upload them and let, uh, let it be housed in HDX for exporting. If, if we can just add to that, um, the data we export to HGX, how the process works is it takes a snapshot of OpenStreetMap. It does not consider validation, which is essentially an internal process that we employ at hot to make sure we, we uh, increase the data quality. So uh, data is exported as a snapshot from OSM. So we just need to ensure that we're as close to the, you know, to the action, to the additions as we can. Thank you so much um, for that. So um, the next question I have from Arnold, um, does HOT also engage in discussions with authorities in their target countries to make more data available um, as open data, uh, data sets for integration in OSM and um, HDX? Um, I'm not sure if, if you got that question, uh, but I'm happy to repeat. Uh, maybe this I'll pass it to Rebecca, if that's okay. Um, I'm so sorry, I actually did, couldn't hear that um, particularly clearly. Is there, could you either repeat or is there somewhere I could read that? Sure, um, I can repeat. So the question is, uh, does HOT also engage in dis uh, discussions with authorities in their target countries? Um, to make more data available maybe let's let's uh, yeah um this. yeah so we sort of have two angles for that i guess one is kind of um partnership engagement with local authorities or, or um, national governments um that does happen in some contexts depending on what we're mapping um and um, the goals of certain projects um there's some um kind of governments for example which have um really implemented OSM in a very thoughtful um, and intensive way as part of their disaster management, um, like the Indonesian National Disaster Management um, Agency. Um, and so there are some examples where kind of official, of official um, government groups have really taken this up. Um, there are also, I think, kind of other examples of where as we move, the data kind of becomes, is useful and therefore becomes used. And that's, um, Kind of potentially more reactive like responding to the event as it happens rather than kind of um you know a long-term um strategic um engagement um there are also i think quite a lot of ways in which um local authorities engage with um opening up their data and that's something that we are looking at like kind of where governments have open data how can we um import that into osm and things like that um, data imports are a kind of notoriously difficult and um, tough thing to do, but um, where there is um, open data available, that's obviously something that we want to use to be able to improve the map um, as much as we can. Um, and there are a lot of ways in which kind of local authorities use data outside of disaster management, humanitarian response, of course. Um, so kind of, I guess, reaching outside the humanitarian space more into the development space. Thank you very much for that, uh, Rebecca. And I'm mindful of time. We're uh, only six minutes uh, to the end. So I'm just going to go through a few more questions coming from the audience. Uh, maybe to touch on the quality assurance, Paul, um, there are quite a number of questions on that. So um, one is from uh, Rodabe. 
Um, so asking about uh, how you deal with uh, data quality, because uh, as you mentioned, data is coming from uh, volunteers and uh, different uh, data literacy level and um, um, different understanding of the platform itself. So uh, how do you deal with that? Maybe if you can um, go back to like the process of uh, validation and quality assurance and then uh, uh, speak to that. Uh, over to you, Paul. Yeah, um, th there's, a, there's a number of different aspects and layers to that. Um, at the heart of it, as, as we've mentioned, OpenStreetMap is a community generated contributed data source, right? So. That does mean that there is also a set of expectations around contributions to that and a lot of standardization going on and people just discussing like what should be the standards of data editions, what should be the tagging and trying to kind of structure that whole process. So there's a lot of volunteers with actually kind of eyes on the on the data as well. Um, there's different entities at work here. On the one side, there's the OpenStreetMap Foundation. Uh, there's a, a data working group there that keeps active track of contributions, is looking for issues in data quality and data licensing and stuff like that. Um, that's essentially kind of a last line of defense. So we try not to make sure it escalates to that level, but there is a kind of a formal level of um, um, review, well, not quite review, but um, uh, of, of verification going on, what people are actually tracking, like what good data is going in, uh, do we see structural issues, how can we address those, etc. Internally at Hot Dot, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, um, there we have a very dedicated group of um, of fellow data, and that's what we call people that essentially do a second pass of review on the data. So the first pass is people actually contributing data via the Task and Manager and Remote Sensing platforms. So Task and Manager is the name of the product that um, uh, mappers actually engage with, enter um, where they pick a square, an area to map. They add buildings there, but then it goes to a second pass of verification uh, via the validators. Um, so we pick up a lot of data quality issues in that process. And at the end of the day, there's also a third pass, which tries to look at a general area, like do roads connect well? Um, uh, are we able to deliver um, usable data that can be used for logistics and routing and et cetera? Um, however, yeah, that there is always the possibility of sl things slipping through or uh, people making maybe deliberate mistakes or vandalism, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of also, at the end of the day, it is a community process, right? So uh, there's a lot of people that try to uh, be mindful and cognizant of, of errors and things slipping through and try to correct those. Um, and as soon as issues are noted, they're often quite fast um, in fixing it up. Uh, there's a lot of um, also scientific literature that compares the quality of OpenStreetMap data to closed and proprietary data sources. And in general, it compares uh, very well uh, because of just the high level of uh, scrutiny that's on the overall um, on the data source as a whole. Thank you so much, Paul. I think that uh, really is useful. Um, so maybe this one, I will um, pass it to uh, Jan. Um, and I think it's um, related to the Turkey-Syria uh, crisis. So the question from Ale Alexander is, uh, do you uh, know a system or systematically which are the hotspots of um, lacking coverage or updated data? Um, maybe over to you, Jan. Is there a systematic way of uh, identifying the hotspots that are uh, lacking um, data? Um, so, so let me also just try to try to elaborate on that um uh, the again it, it really depends on the, the the actors and also the volunteers that are on the ground so um you can follow things through news etc but if there is no specific request or if there's no specific activity from the ground to coordinate with like it is sometimes a little bit harder to identify uh, going beyond like what's there, ex what, what, what's already there on the ground. But in order to just identify these weak spots and identify these needs, like, like it, it, it heavily relies on the community that is um, working with the data and, and collaborating and, and contributing to the data also to identify there. So um, without 
that connection or without a deep local con connection and context, it would be a little bit hard to identify those gaps. Just one thing that I'd yeah. like to add on that, and also to data quality, by the way, um, an area of focus for us is to use more um, also automated ways of both tracking data quality and assigning metrics to that so we can identify hotspots in bad and good data quality better. Uh, that also means that we can use indicators from other data sources to identify where there's gaps in OpenStreetMap data. So we can use uh, things like uh, population statistics, uh, maybe government data sets, et cetera, as well to figure out where there's gaps in, in data. One um, snipe of that is that a lot of population statistics like WellPop also use OpenStreetMap data as an input again. So you do risk comparing OSM data to, to OSM data to some extent. <laughs> Um, but we are trying to, or working to create a lot more kind of um, automatic tooling and data quality checks to that end. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I know we are uh, on time and we may uh, go over like one or two minutes. Um, I just want to give you that last chance to maybe talk uh, about the upcoming projects or initiatives that uh, HOT is working on and how can individuals and organizations get involved um, in the mapping efforts. So maybe I'll give this to Honey. Yeah, just um, in relation to the OSM data gaps that Sean and Paul uh, discussed, uh, the Asia Pacific Hub has developed a QGIS plugin that compares uh, OSM data completeness using Microsoft AI buildings as the reference layer. And we have also used uh, disaster risk layers to show highly um, high disaster risk areas with high uh, OSM data gaps or need for um, mapping activities. So this can, uh, you can check it out, the repository from in GitHub, I pasted it on the chat box. And also please watch out, we will have a virtual talk about this plugin in Phosphor-G. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you um, very much, uh, Rebecca, Paul, Jan, Honey, um, for your presentations and for the uh, wonderful uh, conversation. Um, and thank you for uh, our audience for joining us uh, in this uh, dataset deep dive webinar. Um, and uh, we hope uh, you have gained a deeper understanding of the power and potential of open mapping and humanitarian aid, and that you are inspired to get involved and support uh, this important work. If you are interested in learning more or getting involved uh, with HDX or HOT, please visit our websites at www.hdx.org and www.hotosm.org. Thanks again and have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone.